Beginning in 1921, in his magazine L'Esprit Nouveau, and later in his book Versun Architecture, or Toward in Architecture, the French-Swiss architect Charles-Edouard Genre, or Le Corbusier as he called himself, wrote what amounted to brilliant pieces of propaganda for what he called a new architecture. A great epoch has begun. There exists a new spirit. Industry, overwhelming us like a flood which rolls on toward its destined ends, has furnished us with new tools adapted to this new epoch, animated by a new spirit. The problem of the house is the problem of the epoch. We must create the mass production spirit for the mass produced house. Le Corbusier was beginning here to conjure a, a new architecture, one that would respond to the challenges imposed by modern industrialization, uh, the mass production of houses using standardized building parts, building components. But at the same time, he wanted to reconcile these challenges with the great architecture of the past, which for him meant the classical architecture of Greece and Rome. The new architecture, Le Corbusier said, would be a machine for living. Years earlier, in 1914, he had conceived what he called the Domino House. The name is constructed from the Latin word domus, for house, and innovation. The Domino is really more of a diagram than a building. You can see uh, it's, it's really a superstructure. Le Corbusier called it a chassis, onto which any number of variations of houses could be outfitted. It's a diagram that is not yet bound by room layout or any kind of decorative trim. Actually, it doesn't even have an enclosure yet. The walls, the elevations are, are not on. It's, it's, it's all plan and all section. It, nevertheless, the domino would, would be understood as a kind of primitive hut of the modern. As I say, the domino is all plan and section, no elevational surfaces, no wrapper. Uh, it's proper to understand it really as an emblem, uh, as much as a building, uh, a diagram of a new technological and constructional paradigm of mass production, standardization, repetition, and so forth. It's really a prototype of potential of the new technology uh, of reinforced concrete, glass, and steel. But this diagram, with this sort of concentrated energy of slab, column, circulation, and base contains a lot of implication that Le Corbusier will explore for the next several decades in his houses. So let us look at the domino in some detail. The diagram comprises three horizontal slabs. The first floor slab is on six sort of box-like footings that raises it slightly above the ground. And then the columns that seem to go through the slabs hold up the next two slabs. It's really initially to be read as a kind of constructional integer, a constructional unit that would be the basis for any building. Let's look at it in more detail. The columns are set back from the long side of the slab, and yet they're very, very close to the short sides of the slab. This makes a clear differentiation between front and side. We should remember this because it'll become very important when we see how Le Corbusier develops that. The columns also mark off equal bays. There's a kind of rhythm, there's a rigor, there's a mathematical underpinning to the spacing of the columns, and there's actually a proportional relationship between the bays. The footings emphasize the building's relation to the ground. It's neither buried in the ground, nor is it yet suspended from the ground. It's just pulled up so that there's a distinction between the slab and the earth. The domino is an example of what Le Corbusier called an objet type, or a typal object, or an object type. Um, in his early sketches and essay, Le Corbusier celebrates the grain silos in North America, these big cylindrical storage containers, along with automobiles, 
ocean liners and other accessories of the machine age that he saw as the materialization of pure form. It was in part the volume of these uh, objets type that was important for him, um, but also the fact that, that they had been refined over time, that they had become pure forms or these, these figural volumes uh, through an evolution of use and production. In his paintings too, ordinary objects of daily life like glasses and plates or pipes and bottles, guitars and pianos, these appear to him intensely interesting first and foremost because of their simple shape, their contour. But he thought that volumes viewed in light, even simple everyday objects that were volumetric figures viewed in light could trigger deep fundamental sensations and affects. As an example of what he regarded as this universal reach of the concept of objet type, Le Corbusier made this comparison. On the left top, you see the Greek temple at Paestum. On the right is the Parthenon. He understood the Greek temple as a kind of objet type that had over centuries been evolved and refined, but out of a basic rule had become more and more perfect. Below the Greek temple, you see two automobiles. On the left is the Umber Cabriolet. This is around 1907. On the right is the Delage Grand Sport of 1921. He compared the Greek temple with the modern automobile, with the machine, to say that they are both objet type, that they are refined over time, but also to make the point that in both cases, one has to start with a standard, a, a, a strict sort of diagram of the object in order to move forward toward perfection. The lesson is that the ancient temple and the modern automobile are objet type that can be refined over time. But you have to start with a standard, a kind of inaugural diagram in order to achieve that perfection.